I thought it would be interesting after this last interview I had with a Bitcoin Maxi just to address some of the things I wish I'd said at the time and go into my thoughts at the time as I was talking. Uh, and it might be informative and provide you extra kind of bullish feelings about XRP and maybe some more of like a level-headed approach when we consider some of the things that he said. So what was the first crypto that you got into? Bitcoin, of course. I'm hearing that all the time. Yeah, 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 exactly. Why, why Bitcoin? Yeah. And so the, the motivation for me saying why Bitcoin is because it was quite hard for me to... For, it, it, was, it was difficult for me to understand why Bitcoin would be the number one choice Having talked with him and talked with many other people in Dubai, I also realized that Bitcoin made these people rich, right? It was their, it was their route to becoming millionaires. So I kind of want to put, put this to you. If an asset made you rich, would you believe that is the be all end all? Like you're, well, even if you don't think that, you might be more likely to think that if, if, Bitcoin has served you, bringing you from $300 a month to now being a millionaire eight years later, you would likely have a very positive outlook on that asset. So even if it is Bitcoin, and he's very knowledgeable about Bitcoin, but I just wanted to say that because that's why he's biased towards Bitcoin. He can't possibly be biased about Bitcoin because of its utility. <laughs> like that's not even, that's not even an argument but he can be biased because it is the asset that's made him rich. Thought that might be interesting. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question that for people who are getting into crypto right now, they think that there, is an, there are options. And it's scary to me when I see people who, they, ha they say that they invested in crypto and they have a whole bunch of cryptos, they don't even own any Bitcoin. I think it's kind of a thing now it happens. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> it happens because people look for utility more people are looking for utility first and just not buying Bitcoin because you would just skip Bitcoin if you're looking for utility, right? And this is what I was thinking. Obviously, I'm thinking all of this at that time. Um, but remember, this is a conversation. It wasn't supposed to be a debate. It was supposed to be completely friendly. I didn't want to argue. There were sometimes I missed an opportunity because he would just kept talking, which is fine. I wanted him to be able to talk and speak his side. I, I was there with two ears and one mouth. Um, so obviously there are times and I'll highlight those when I wanted to talk, but. But when I was getting into crypto, there was a lot more solid education about what crypto is. So everybody understood that, okay, if you're gonna invest in crypto, you need to have Bitcoin. It must be at least 60% of your portfolio minimum or whatever. So a lot of the Bitcoin maxis were there teaching, basically installing the Bitcoin mindset inside your head. Installing the Bitcoin, ma so Bitcoin maxis installing the Bitcoin mindset into your head. There is a word for that. <laughs> brainwashing <laughs> did you come in at the wrong time i know no, it was, no, no, it was so, long enough ago to where it's yes. worked but at that time what was it yeah like? so look the, the time i was getting into cryptocurrency it wasn't the same as now where like right now it's very popular everybody knows it and i got into it because of a real use case so for me it was like i had no bank account banks couldn't open an account for me because i didn't qualify to have a bank account apparently you need to have a source of income as a job or whatever, or you need to have a student card to prove that you're a student to get a student account. I didn't have those. So I would go online to find work and I would find jobs, but people would struggle to pay me because I didn't have a PayPal account. PayPal wasn't working in Africa, that, you know, in the area that I was at. So Bitcoin was the only solution to get into it. Mm -hmm. So I started working online and getting paid in Bitcoin and then I just started holding those coins. And the more I, and a funny story about it is that the other day I was like, okay, I need to try if this thing actually can, is real. Can I get, the first question that everybody asks, how do I cash out the Bitcoin into real money, right? So I took the, a little bit of BTC, put it on a website called Local Bitcoins to sell it. And I was being offered a lot more money than the price point, the market value, right? So that's when I started to realize that, wait, this thing is actually a big deal. And then I started digging. My question is, and I'm not doubting that that's a thing. My question is, 
how are you being offered more money than its market value when there's just exchanges? People could have gone and bought a Bitcoin on an exchange. Why would they pay above market value for it from an individual when they can just go to an exchange? He also said the other day. So that was confusing. Um, maybe he meant the other year or something. I don't know. But that's just one thing I was thinking at the time. Digging deeper and deeper and then I ended up selling my car, bought more Bitcoin, moved out of my apartment to buy more Bitcoin and I basically scaled down my life to, inv to get enough money to invest in Bitcoin and then, you know, yeah, in the long run it works out. So what, what's, what in your mind is the use case of Bitcoin? It depends on who you ask, right? So Bitcoin is bought. So this was a really interesting response and I always listen to the initial response of somebody because that's usually their, uh, that's where the like the foundation of their understanding lies, I think. So I said, what's the utility of Bitcoin? And he said, depends on who you ask. Shouldn't there be a set in stone utility for Bitcoin? Um, but what he actually has is a really good point. I've just switched up on you there. He has a really good point. Upon reflecting, Bitcoin does have different uses for different people, but I'll embellish on this in a second. For someone in Africa who's got nothing, who has no access to bank the banking system, who is completely on their own, Bitcoin acts as a way to solve that problem. They can engage with transactions across border without needing a bank. This allows an individual outside of the banking system to become banked. This is a real utility. Then you've got big institutions that might use. And then you've got people in Venezuela, for example, who will actually use XRP as a deflationary. No, <laughs> I said XRP. Then you've got people in Venezuela, which he says in a second, that your currency is hyper inflating. You need to move to an asset or a currency that doesn't hyperinflate to protect the worth or the value of your assets. So Bitcoin becomes a store of st stable value. And so from person to person, Bitcoin does actually exist in a different capacity. With that said, that's the way it used to be. What I felt that Gray was missing was looking at right now and the future. Obviously, Bitcoin has made him rich. That happened all in the past. Bitcoin was the king. Yes, it's still at the top, but it's not king in all of these different areas. For example, you've got store of value. Well, if you want to store against hyperinflation uh, in your currency, you go to a stable coin. Stable coins are a better solution than Bitcoin, which goes up and down, right? There's a solution for as a currency. There are other solutions now that are just better than Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin costs, even we're using the Lightning Network, it's still not that fast, especially when you compare it to XRP. And, you know, XRP used as a currency is a better solution than Bitcoin. So in the past, you have Bitcoin as really the only one and it can do a load of, load of things. But as time has gone on, those little individual utility things that Bitcoin had going for it have just been bettered by lots of other different assets. And so that's where we stand right now. And I wanted to say all of this in here. But again, I wasn't trying to start arguments. I was trying to let him talk so everyone could hear his side of the story. Let's get into it. Both a currency a store of value, but also it's a payment network. You can do both. So for someone in the UK, it's more likely a speculative asset because they don't understand why they need to use it when they can use PayPal and banks and, and what have you. For someone in Venezuela, is basically an escape route from the traditional currency that is plummeting. Uh, you know, it's hyperinflated. For someone in Zimbabwe, is a means to send money out of the country because there's no any other uh, quicker means of doing this. To so there's no other quicker means of doing this. Yes, there are. If someone in Zimbabwe wanted to send their, their value across border, they could just use XRP now and they wouldn't pay as much fees and it would be a lot quicker, a lot more reliable. Like Bitcoin has just been bettered 
in various ways by various assets. So it was little things like that. You can see my face right there. I'm like biting my lip because I'm trying not to say anything. But these are all things that were in my head. Other people who fully understand it like you and me, it's probably all of these things in total. And for people who value freedom, like myself, I look at Bitcoin as a passport to the global economic system because I was born and raised in Africa. When people in Europe and in the US were investing in, in Amazon and Google and all these big stocks that made a lot of people rich, the tech bubble, we had no access to that market. But now I have access to the same market that those, that those, guy, those guys have because it's now on the blockchain. So, you know, Bitcoin to me means all these things together. Mm. Yeah. I had a theory, uh, I heard a th theory the other yeah. day about how at a certain point of Bitcoin mining, it takes too much energy mm. to mine, at which point the, the network would collapse or something like that. It was like, a, mm -hmm. it, that, like the, the move into QFS. Yes. What, what can you tell me about that? What they're referring to is that, so right now you get a block reward for mining Bitcoin and that number is increasing every 210,000 blocks. But then what will happen when we have reached to close to zero where you're not producing, you're not making any money per block? Well, Bitcoin then becomes mining simply because settling of transactions and you generate income from transaction fees. But also, you know, this is technology. It evolves, it changes their updates, right? So there will be, I'm sure, economic models that allows for people to still benefit from it. Another interesting thing is... So I found this an interesting response because basically what he was saying is that, yes, that's right. It will cost too much and it would be too en energy consumptive to run Bitcoin. But his reason and justification for saying that that won't be a problem is by saying technology will evolve. And this to me struck me as a, an interesting response because you can't guarantee that technology will evolve enough to make the mining of Bitcoin feasible. You're almost hoping that technology does evolve enough in order to keep Bitcoin alive. The, the, the place I heard about that QFS collapse for Bitcoin was on the Charlie Ward show. There was a, a girl called Emily, who's a XLM person, and a Dave XRP Lion, who's an extreme Bitcoin person, uh, extreme XRP person. So I know all of those people are extreme, and it was quite a, like a conspiratorial conversation. But they seem pretty confident that Bitcoin would literally collapse and it wouldn't be able to function uh, at that point. Um, that didn't feel like that was the answer he gave there, but the answer he did give was technology basically needs to improve in order to keep Bitcoin alive. That was quite interesting. Bitcoin has always been known to be like a payment layer, right? That's all it does, it's just a, a currency protocol. But now you have things like ordinals, which are growing really fast. Over 1,700 Bitcoins have now been burned in as transaction fees on the network all that money is going back to to the miners so you can see that as the bitcoin layer expands more economic value is added to the chain and then miners are even now able to make more money i do think that if the ordinal and brc20 aspect of it grows even after the halving that's coming soon bitcoin miners are still going to be making more money yeah who do, you, who do you think is going to benefit most from the transactions of Bitcoin? Because it doesn't seem like institutions would have the best use for it. Institutions would have the best use for it. For example, like a, an XRP token mm. on, on the Ripple, on the XRPL. Yeah. They've geared that whole blockchain towards specifically institutional payments. And sure. it seems to be going that way with the partnerships and or, or whatever you want to talk about. It doesn't seem like in that capacity as a payment, I'm also not involved in Bitcoin really at all in mm -hmm. that world or anything. Right. So please tell me if, if this is not the case. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem like Bitcoin's being used for large scale value transfer. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So basically, 
there are so many options right now that are better than Bitcoin. Who is Bitcoin actually even serving at this point? Was was the kind of the thought process behind it? It's a very, very interesting question because it speaks to the view that you have where you place institutions and say governments, for example, in some kind of light where they're more important for things to work or to, to adapt. Uh, they have to adapt something for it to scale and to become more valuable, right? But that in the Bitcoin space, that has been proven to be wrong. It's actually the opposite. So something like Bitcoin is growing really fast, regardless of whether institutions and governments have been pushing it back. So this was a really interesting point that he made. And it was surprising to me to hear that Bitcoin has been growing up to 70%. Um, and he makes a really good point to say that actually my, my question was more about my view of how institutions need to use it. And that's more important. But we're going to get into something in a second about, you know, what the dark and the dark side of crypto and where XRP stands in that, because in a way, he's completely right that we are talking about the kind of the reliance on institutions rather than the liberty or the freedom that decentralization creates, even though there are nuances. I know XRP and the XRP ledger is decentralized. I know this, um, but he brought up a good point and it had me thinking. And if you look at projects that scale and that become successful are the ones that have very little to do with institutions and government, which are, you could call it in technical terms, the, the ones that are more centralized, like Ripple, you have given an example. Look at how it struggled. Ripple has been around since 2013. A lot of people don't know that. I can tell you a story about this. I've, uh, I've shared this on multiple podcasts, but there was a time where I was getting into crypto. Ripple was already around. And then I was looking at the price. I'm like, wow, look at Bitcoin. It's like, what, 600 or something? And then Ripple is less than a dollar. Maybe the smart thing to do is to buy more Ripple because it's banks and governments. By the time it reaches up to Bitcoin, I'll become super rich because we're hearing about story of people who bought Bitcoin at $5 or less than a dollar. And I was like, I'm never going to have that chance. Maybe Ripple is the way to go. So I sold a good amount of my Bitcoin for XRP. Sad story. <laughs> Sad story. But I have more thoughts on 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 this, but uh, I, I remember thinking, oh man, people who are watching this in the comments are going to think he sold his XRP, he sold his Bitcoin for XRP and then sold his XRP <laughs> uh, again for Ethereum or whatever it was. I was like, I'm going to kill it. And I realized years went by, Repo just was being outperformed by Bitcoin. Luckily, I ended up selling the XRP for Ethereum when it came out and that I was able to outperform Bitcoin with that investment. The thing is, if he'd held on to that, that XRP, it would have outperformed Ethereum. Literally, XRP even flipped Ethereum. Lots of people don't know that. It flipped it in market cap. So he would have done better holding on to that XRP. Um, again, something I wanted to say, but I wanted to let him talk. <laughs> Which ended up really well. But I also know people who entered the crypto market right at the same time as myself, and they invested in Ripple because these were like sophisticated investors. They know about the markets and they said Bitcoin doesn't make sense. Ripple has a real life use case. They invested in it. To this day, they haven't made any money. That's because they probably haven't sold. And if you got in at that time that he's talking about, you have made money. It just it's just come back down, uh, but you've still made money, but you, it's just come back down. They obviously haven't sold at the point when XRP flipped Ethereum, right? So there's nuances to all of this stuff, but obviously things I say is going to be leaning towards the XRP narrative, things he says going to be towards the Bitcoin narrative. Yeah, that's a problem with... Yeah, so eight years, eight years in XRP, you haven't made any life-changing so eight years in XRP, no life changing returns. That is completely false. That's completely false. It went up so much in the last bull run, even though uh, the court case happened and it brought it back down and suppressed it. There was so much money made in XRP, more money, more gains to be made in XRP than any other of the top 10 at least. Returns. It's crazy. 
it's being outperformed by a high market cap coin like Bitcoin. If that's not a scam, then you have to explain to me what it is because I can give another example of that, what you alluded to. So the most regulated exchange in crypto to ever exist was FTX. Look what happened. So just because you have institutional stamps and government stamp doesn't really make it safe or secure or more robust. You could actually argue that it makes it weaker in this space because it's a very high volatile. The technical aspect of things have to be more solid than the flowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough being an XRP. I will say that. Much. There you go. I think you're in XRP. I am very heavily, very heavily. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to hear. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm. I think I'm very well placed. But what I'm pa paper would have been a better investment for you. Well, okay. if I want, yeah, to get more money in a short term, then mm -hmm. yeah, a meme coin is. You know, maybe that's maybe that's the way to go. So he said. He said that Pepe, you know, the meme coin would have been a better play for me, and. Yes, in the short term, it probably would have been, but that's not where I, I'm looking. I'm looking into the long term. What this trip to Dubai did for me was actually showed me that there are, in fact, tons of ways to make lots of money in the short term that I have completely missed out on because of, I've been kind of blinkered and looking like this. Um, so there are learnings to take from all of this. And he's absolutely right. I could have made lots of money in other coins that I haven't made in XRP. But that's not my outlook. That's not how I'm looking at things. It's not, it's not, it's not how I'm investing. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a lot of things when, when it's like a dark side of crypto. Mm. And I, I think that XRP and Ripple are on the dark side of crypto. If you define crypto as a way for finance to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. So in, so specifically in DeFi, Going siding with Ripple on things in the in in the acknowledgement that we're going to be more regulated and go further away from a decentralized finance system, acknowledging that XRP Ledger is decentralized, um, is against the traditional view of crypto, which is to separate yourself from the state. But being in Ripple and XRP or invested in the idea that Ripple is going to grow and the XRP token is going to have more utility. Um, we're kind of on that darker side of crypto. We're on the opposite side of what's traditionally expected for blockchain and crypto. That's what I was trying to get at. In that context, Bitcoin being decentralized, all the, all the ones that I, I think a lot of people <laughs> here have been kind of talking about, the, the tokens, they, they go to the true nature of crypto, mm -hmm. which is decentralization, power to the individual. XRP and Ripple is a different mindset and it's more towards regulation. You're kind of on the dark side. You kind of want regulation to come in because if the SEC are coming after a specific token, usually when the SEC come after a to or a, a company, it's usually good news for the price of that, mm. that company. It's usually like a rite of passage. And obviously there's companies like Amazon and there's a countless list of companies that the SEC have come up, come after and afterwards have exploded. So this rite of passage that I'm talking about is really important. But in investing in XRP, you're also accepting that actually this isn't about the decentralization for us. It's, it's about something else, mm -hmm. almost trying to ride the wave of regulation, but that right. isn't to the true nature of crypto. Yeah. So I'm also not acknowledging the fact that XRP is decentralized and that XRP can be used as a way to separate ourselves to become sovereign individuals from the state, right? But the whole price increase of XRP over time will be as a result of these regulations and institutional adoption. So it, you know, it goes in balances, but I do understand that XRP also can be used as a decentralization medium. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, we, we can talk about regulation. So when you hear regulation, what do you think regulation is for? And because you say like Ripple in the traditional world is what is in the light side of finance, right? Bitcoin is actually the dark side. Yes. Right? Yeah, exactly. But what makes, what do you think regulation is good? I think it's good for companies like Ripple. No, but it's good. For, 
it's good for companies. Yeah. But is it good for investors, for people, like individuals? Um, if you catch it before the regulation, afterwards, it's a nightmare. Like what, I, what I'm saying is what comes after this, mm. after regulation is no opportunity for anyone. Okay. What I meant by that is that once the regulations all come in and adoptions come in, there's not really going to be anything happening with XRP because it will have done all of what it needed to do to get to that point. Just like, just like Bitcoin, <laughs> for example, right? Bitcoin was pennies, then it will potentially go up into the hundreds of thousands. But from this point at 30,000, I don't even know what the price of XRP is, uh, Bitcoin is right now. But from this point to a million or even $100,000, it's like a 3x Right, it's done, it's done all the life-changing gains that it will do. I'm saying XRP would be that, and that's why I say it would be a nightmare because I think it would get delisted from lots of places if it is listed as like a partial security or something or however that operates. Um, it's going to be harder in the future to get those massive gains from XRP than from before regulation, through regulation, into regulation. Okay. All right. That's what comes after, but there's a, ride, there's a wave to ride mm -hmm. on that journey. And I think the, the mental, the, the framework that we're all working on in this XRP community is that the money, the people who run the money, mm. they're going to make as much money as they can. So if we look at the solutions to the, to the problems that they have, yeah. there's going to be money made in that journey. But what we often lose sight of is that there's actually opportunity to make money before all of that, like, mm. like you guys are doing, right. um, that we miss out on because we're focused so much on riding this wave, um, fully acknowledging that afterwards it's going to be like CBDCs, surveillance, mm. like loss of sover sovereignty, 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 sovereignty. I always yeah. say that wrong. Um, so we like know this, but it also blinds us from everything that's happening in Dubai. Like everyone making money here. They're not, they're not waiting on XRP. <laughs> I think when you, when you say that to me, it almost feels like you put so much trust and belief in regulators so let me ask you a question have you ever have you ever seen a regulator or a politician and your reaction to them being wow that guy is really smart no thank you so i think there is something to be said about that then right <laughs> So here's the, the little thing that we, we were not on the same page about here. Let's, let's look at this completely logically and zoomed out. Uh, Gray is from Africa. In Africa, he had very little, very little to do with the banking system because he wasn't involved at all. And there is this mindset there, I would imagine, that you're on your own. And you need to find your own way out if you're going to find your own way out, right? And so he finds... Uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as the way out, as a decentralized medium to get out of that system and kind of graduate. That's because he's on his own. So his, his mindset and his worldview is based on that. Take me, for example, who's grown up in the UK, where we've had a regulated environment, we've been in a banking environment, where we've grown up understanding that regulations make rules and rules are good like there's no there's no corruption at least like on the surface of it or we don't want to get into that but there's an inherent trust in the system that we have here that you don't necessarily have in africa so when we look or at least in uh, wherever he's from in africa because i know there's lots of countries in africa but naturally, when we invest in things growing up in this system, we would naturally look towards the regulators. We would naturally look for regulators to adopt certain technology or, or start looking into certain technology as a rite of passage into the mainstream. So that's out of the box. We, we are prepared to kind of give up some of our sovereignty to these regulators, understanding that they probably have in some way our best interests at heart and you can take that however you want it but there's a certain level of trust that we have in the west and uh, uh non-existence of trust trust that you have in certain countries in africa and it shapes your worldview and also then how you navigate investing right because this is a fast moving wheel right and you have to be nimble and fast and smart enough to figure it out and to make sure that 
um, from a game theory perspective, you win. And I don't, so if you don't think of most regulators as smart, so what makes you think that you win? Because I know who they're out to serve. Okay. I know exactly who they're out to serve, the already rich people in the traditional system. Sure. So it's like a known thing. Mm. I know that they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about because right. we get so into the weeds on crypto and blockchain yes. that we know what's happening and what's coming. Mm. They don't seem to know, but they do know how they can position themselves to most best affect them and their peers. So I've got an interesting analogy that just come to me here. And it's actually, funnily enough, an African style <laughs> uh, analogy. It's basically when you're investing in XRP, what you're doing is, is you're go let's pretend we're a lion, right? You, you're a lion, I'm a lion. We go to where the gazelles sleep, right? We go there like two weeks early. We go there two weeks early, we camp out, we lay in the tall grass so we're camouflaged and everything. And you've got some guy, some other lion just runs past with a gazelle in his mouth and he's like, yeah, this is great. I've been running all around. I've just come across all these gazelles and I've just got one here. I'm rich. Like I've, I've got all the food I need. Why, why are you sat here? There's no gazelle here. Like why, why are you sat here? And the reason we're sat here, obviously what, meanwhile, he's running around the savannah, kind of like just getting all the gazelles he wants. We're sat here waiting because we know that on the migration of gazelles, they all stop right here. And we're waiting there for that reason, right? We know the gazelles stop. They take a rest around this area. We know the gazelles are coming. So we're just gonna wait here rather than expend all the energy, run around, hope we catch one just in, a, in, in, the, in the field somewhere, right? That's how I really view this. Um, and that's, that's essentially how I view our XRP investments versus running around getting uh, meme coins. So it's a power game, right? Yes. They'll play the power technique to align themselves with the big rich people, the elite. But now, from that game theory to a retail investor, so this is maybe some advice to repo investors. <laughs> In a game theory of repo, you, only the top guys will win the elites. I think it's a lot of people delude themselves that, oh, if repo wins, then they win too. No, you, you're better off trading other things that are not highly centralized, that are completely decentralized because you have a chance to buy in and uh, gain the m maximum return on investment. So obviously I think here he's speaking to his own experience, going the completely decentralized route, being someone who needed to be decentralized from the country in order to kind of get out and move to Dubai like, it, like he did. He's speaking from his own experience and I don't think necessarily makes makes the argument necessarily makes sense but it makes sense for him and his story and you can completely see why he has that mindset another example of bad investments for retail is this there have been new projects recently that launched aptos sui and all that kind of stuff the last trend of layer two solutions and tokens have been coming out of the vc realm of silicon valley and all that right but how many people really made life-changing money from those projects? Very little. Because most of these projects were selling tokens in pre-sales to VCs. By the time they launch on Binance and centralized exchanges, they're dumping on the investors. So this is the same fate that is faced by repo investors. It's not that XRP doesn't really make money. For early investors, because it was an early inside a selling kind of deal those guys they make a lot of money maybe they sell 200 million every year or something like that they, that's what happened in 2021 but for anyone who just invested waiting for a 20x you're in for a bad time but for a heart for a guy at the top who has a lot of repo tokens xrp tokens for them it's like well they just need enough liquidity a lot of people to hold and buy into it for them to dump on you because they bought their tokens for nothing Whereas you're going there to buy them at 80 cents, right? I don't necessarily see the difference between that and Bitcoin. If someone can like tell me, because isn't it true that there's like really only like 10 holders of just a vast percentage of Bitcoin and it's just in individual wallets, so individuals. Um, couldn't they just 
sell it all, dump it on on the retail, and it all goes down. Like I, I don't see the difference between that and any other token. It's just like what is that token or that project out there to serve? What are they trying to do? Like how high is the incentive to dump on people? You know, and it seems it's clearly low incentive for Bitcoin. It's low for for XRP. It's high for companies like Aptos, <laughs> right? I, I think that's just that's how you. I think that's how you calculate it. It's just based on what is their desire to dump, and we would have seen it dump already for Bitcoin if that was the if that was the the desire, but it's not. Right. So, if you understand things like this, you you a lot of people hate things like meme coins, right? They say, oh, it's a, oh, it's a shit coin. But those ones are actually much more geared towards if you entered early on those projects, you're more likely to make money. But no, they're all they're all geared that way. If you enter early on anything, you make money. It, that's not that's not an argument. You know that they will also collapse at least. So from a game theory perspective, so I do agree. <laughs> Sorry to keep butting in. Meme coins are probably the most predictable because they are pure human behavior. You can drop the Fibonacci retracement tool on the on the chart there. You can see if there is a speculation pump, it's probably going to go to one of these lines, then it's probably going to go to zero, right? That's that's very easily to easy to calculate. There's there's a known beginning and there's a known end. It's just the in between is somewhat predictable, and that's the good thing about meme coins, but um, I wouldn't say that that's a more beneficial asset to be in over ones with utility you know the game you're playing and at least you can position yourself to win. And that's what I said about XRP. We know the game that's being played. It's just being played by the regulators who we have a little bit more faith in than he does just from, you know, our lives. On the XRP investment, it's just very difficult. It is difficult. I, right. won't, I won't deny it. But also the definition of early changes from person to person. Yep. Uh, because if you're looking at partnerships for the future and the, the regulation and stuff, that's mm. down the line. So in that capacity, we're early. If you define it this as early, you could make that case. Um, but certainly th there seems to have been some weird things that happened at the beginning of Ripple. Mm -hmm. And the, there was documents released recently that, that allude to that a fact that that's all going to come out to the surface. Mm -hmm. So some people had questions about this part. The, the documents are... Uh, there was a tweet or something uh, where it alluded to the idea that both Brad Garlinghouse and the SEC wanted to delay the release of certain documents. And there was a document. I'm pretty sure there was a document that um, uh, that Phelan guy, the, the, the lawyer who looked through it, or, or Jeremy Hogan looked through it. And it did actually suggest that uh, Ripple wasn't necessarily in the best position either. Like just like the SEC. In fact, the Ripple had more things that were requested of them that they declined than the SEC did. Something along those lines. That's where I was going with that. Um, but we will find out on June the 13th, right? But we are most adamant. I think oftentimes it's like, like that. We're, and I, I'm understanding that. Now I'm coming to like a broader audience that's kind of seeing what everyone thinks. Um, I think w I, I I think we've got good reason that we're focused on what we're focused on, mm. um, but it doesn't help to stay like that. You, I think you're scared of freedom. Like you want to take your funds and you want to put it in uh, in the hands of someone else and say they have to do right by me. You're. But we only think that because we naturally have an inherent trust and a known outcome and a known entity that we're dealing with being the regulators and the governments and the banks, we know it's them and we know where they want to go. They want to make more money. So we have more known factors in our equation than he does. Saying that, no, I don't want to take my investment and be in control and look around what's going on and invest. That's too much risk for me. But I want to put it in the hands of people that I feel I'm safe and then they have the power to basically, so what you're saying is that Ripple has too much power to win, and then you become successful because you're an investor. But if if you did, if in the last five years you took your money out of Ripple 
and made decisions on your own to invest in something else, you could have probably made more money. That's obvious, right? I don't, yeah, I don't deny that. Right. But you're saying that you're scared to do that yourself. So he said you could have probably made more money, right? There's a lot of ifs in there. And he would be right if I, if in the last four years or so, I, you know, or in the last two years, I bought Shiba Inu with all of my money, I would have become a millionaire, right? If I'd sold at the right time. <laughs> it's all ifs. Um, but we also can never predict w where things are going. So it's very difficult to say you should have invested in something else. I should have invested in Bitcoin when I was at university, right? When I was at college. I should have bought I should have bought Bitcoin when it was two cents. I should have. But how could I have? <laughs> like I literally didn't even know about it. But I should have. It's, it's that kind of argument. Self, and then you're putting your trust in an institution. The same as putting money in the bank or in some kind of investment. Uh, so I mostly agree. Mm. And I agree that it it we have that trust in a bank, for example, if we put our money in the bank unlike people from Africa who don't have access to banks, who are on the opposite side of banks, who really don't like banks, we, we have money in the bank, right? Because we can, we have access to it. So it is almost like investing in XRP and Ripple is also like putting your money in a bank. It is that kind of comparison. He, he's right there. It's just we have a natural inclination to be more positive about that than he does. Uh, but it's more about, as I said earlier, investing in something where I know who the beneficiaries of that are. Mm -hmm. And historically, there's always a transitionary period where some people who, who know what's coming, like the, like the internet, yeah. there's some normal people that realize this is going to be quite big and they yeah. invested. Yeah. Um, I, that's kind of how I view that. But in this case, I, I just know, even if it's corrupt, even if there's a power mm. thing, at least I know who's going to benefit. And maybe that knowledge allows me to ride that wave. But hmm. it's not to the true nature of crypto. It's not about the true nature. Uh, right now I'm speaking purely from a PNL perspective, like return on investment. I, I know, I know. I so, can't argue with you on that, you, so, you win. So, so let's look at that and say, okay, cool. You believe that, okay, this as a company is well positioned to do better. That's what you're saying, right? X Ripple is well positioned to do better as a company. Yes. But you're not invested in the company though. You invested, you invested in a token, XRP. I hold XRP. Which has no attachment to the entity itself. So what you're saying is right. That re No attachment to the company itself, other than that it's literally being said as being the heartbeat <laughs> of Ripple. <laughs> like literally XRP is the way that Ripple grows to the next level. Yes, we have RippleNet. RippleNet doesn't use XRP. RippleNet can't scale the global economy like XRP can. Literally, their next level up, their only way to advance to the next level is to start utilizing XRP in on-demand liquidity. Literally, you, you, you can have XRP without Ripple, but Ripple needs XRP, in a way. I think I'm saying that right. People can actually become successful as a company, right? But then you invested in something other than the company itself. So these are two different, two different things. Another way to explain it is this. The SEC lawsuit can destroy XRP, the token. But Ripple, the company, can survive. I, I don't think so. Well, like Ripple still works right now. Yeah, but I think XRP continues to do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, and even without Ripple, XRP still needs, is, is an asset that can do or that can solve the problems that exist, right? It's still, the asset doesn't change if Ripple goes down, right? The adoption of it is now completely on the people and the institutions rather than Ripple kind of uh, ushering everyone in, creating partnerships and creating the usage on the, on the ledger. If Ripple didn't exist, that would just be down. That would be a completely decentralized, way better version than Bitcoin, right? That's essentially what it would become like its utility regardless of how it's if it's a security or not it's yeah but but it's it's a it's just a token it can have no economic value and the blockchain would still function it's not a no but it, w it would function very inefficiently you the higher the price of an xrp the the better it works and the more suited it is to institutional use which is what it's there to 
to be as, to be used as. So if the price of XRP was zero, it would have no utility because it wouldn't be doing what it's supposed to be doing. The gas fees like on Ethereum, where it's actually, you need it. You know, it's, Repo is just a, a centralized blockchain that doesn't really need a token. That's why the SEC is even questioning why, you know, is this a security or not? They don't know. Yeah, I also, I, I also think that that process of defining it as a security or mm. is a right of passage. Okay, but then... Because lots, of, lots it, of big companies have gone through that. Sure, but, but then at the end, let's just say if XRP doesn't make it, Repo will stay. And the people who invested in Repo, the company, they are the beneficiary because they made money from the retail investors like you and I or everyone who invested in Ripple before. But they, those guys never have to benefit anything. It's not a stock. You don't own Ripple stock. You own a token. Whereas when you own Bitcoin, you own the currency itself. When you own it. You see, and, and it just, it's the same for XRP. If you, own, if you own a Bitcoin, you own the thing itself. If you own XRP, you own the currency. <laughs> Like, it's the same as it, it just XRP does things better for payments at the very least than Bitcoin. Ethereum, you actually own the utility token of the blockchain, which is a yeah, and XRP is the utility token of the blockchain. Fundamental part of making Ethereum to work. Yeah, repo is not really like that. There's a company and then there is the token. But the token has utility. So you could say I'm holding well, it for the same reason. Can Binance operate without BNB token? Yes. Thank you. I think that answers everything. So if Binance can operate or can BitGet operate without the BitGet token? Yeah. Yeah. So there's com these are completely two different things. They have, there's the company and the entity and then there's the token. All these tokens are referred to as utility tokens but it's just in the name. It, they don't really serve any fundamental need. In the uh, well, that's, that's, not, that's not true. Um, I think he's looked at Bitcoin potentially as, basically, if you replay that, let's replay that. Let's go back 10 seconds. Listen to what he says about, Bit, about XRP and just pretend he's talking about Bitcoin because that's what I think he's doing. And there's a token. All these tokens are referred to as utility tokens but it's just in the name. It, they don't really serve any fundamental need in the blockchain or in the functionalities of all these entities. Because that's how he views Bitcoin, so therefore that's how he views XRP. Hmm. It's an interesting, interesting thought. I know a lot of XRP guys are gonna hate me for this, but- You're gonna get massive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was me reviewing and giving extra thoughts on that Bitcoin Maxi episode of the podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe. Don't leave without hitting like if you did, in fact, like it. Uh, there's a couple of videos here for you to watch if you're interested. Stay emotionless, and I'll see you in the next one.